It's money. Yeah. It's huge amounts of money, huge amounts of time, other people's livelihoods, other companies involved, subcontractors and so on and so forth. This is serious business. We've got to have the serious conversation. Yeah. The Business of Architecture UK, episode 21. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Super special announcement here on Thursday, 11th of October, 2018. The Business of Architecture UK will be having its next live event at UNI offices at 7A Hoek Place. We will be having a live panel discussion with some of the UK's leading architect, entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders where we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow and impactful architecture. Now, early bird tickets have just gone on sale. They are at 50% below your regular price, and you can get the link, which will be in the info section of this podcast. So those are only going to be at the early bird 50% sale price for a few weeks. So make sure that you go and book your place now. This week, I'm speaking to Johan Taft, who is a business and performance mentor who has worked extensively with construction industry professionals. Now, in this conversation, Johan discusses with me one of the most common threats that he encounters with businesses and architects that he works with that often prevents them from reaching the levels of success that they desire and deserve. So there's some really good in-depth material here that I'm sure you'll find incredibly useful. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. I'm the host, Ryan Willard, and I'm here with my good friend, Johan Taff. How are you, Johan? I'm very well, thank you, Ryan. Thanks for inviting me in again. My Great pleasure. To Always good to uh, have conversations with you. Great, thank so you. So just for the viewers, Johan is a business mentor, a high-performance business mentor, and you've had quite an amazing career. You've worked with all sorts of people from different industries, lots of construction industry people. Yeah surveyors, I know you've worked with lots of property developers, property developers as well, yeah. and you're kind of like the Navy SEALs of business mentors. Um, you often work with companies who are kind of, who are already good, but they're not consistently good. Correct. And I would kind of describe you as somebody who takes that inconsistency and transforms it into businesses where they are consistently and persistently performing at that good level, which is kind of the entry point into becoming a great or an elite organization. Yes, indeed. And you've worked with many architects yes, as well. Yes, I had a great pleasure of working with many architects. Excellent. So we're in good hands today. Thank you. Brilliant. So for you, having worked with a, n a number of architects, what is the single one problem that you most commonly encounter that is like the first thing you always end up working with them on? Well, there's two, actually. Um, the first one is cash flow. Right. And the second one is time management and prioritization. And they both kind of interlock with each other. But shall we focus on the cash flow first? Let's, let's, I think we've probably got enough time just to focus on one. So okay. let's go with the cash flow. Got it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I do when I go into architectural organizations and other businesses, but specifically, especially architecture businesses, mm -hmm. is I take a look at the cash flow. And how do you do that? Ask, ask to look at it. I mean, there's three things I want to look at. I want to look at their management accounts. I want okay. to look at their P&L statement. I want to look at the balance sheet. I want to look at their cash flow. Yeah. And so we take a look. Um, not everyone has them very well organized. Not everyone is aware of what's going on there. And that's why that's the first thing I ask to take a look at. And what are the sort of the kind of warning signals for you when you're looking at a company's cash flow statements? Well, I, just, I basically ask, the first thing I do is I ask for all the, uh, all the invoices that haven't yet been paid and look at the payment date. Right. Quite shocking sometimes. How so? Well, often the terms are 15 days, sometimes 30 days. Yep. And now we're 90 days, 110 days, 145 days, still no payment for substantial sums of money. What kind of problems does that cause in a business? countless problems i mean it's all part of a very bad chain of um clients not paying suppliers who then who then can't pay further suppliers so everyone suffers mm. and someone's got to bite the bullet somewhere in that chain in order to um in order to put it right 
But the problems that that causes in the business is it's just like insufficient blood in your body. Some right. organs are going to stop functioning. So um, inability to pay suppliers on time, inability perhaps to pay staff on time. This is very critical. Good staff will leave. Inability to pay bonuses and um, pay rises or even give any pay rises. There's no money to do that. So again, loss of talent. And yeah. I know it's a very competitive industry. People are looking for good talent all the time. Um, the, the lack of um, being able to reinvest in the business with better systems, better software, better whatever. Um, new premises, perhaps, you know, for as you grow, um, can't do that. Um, but sometimes more critically is uh, organizations with bad cash flow are now using the VAT money, if they've registered the VAT money, to pay these suppliers or to pay their staff because they've got the, the supplies need to come in to keep the projects going. If they can't pay the VAT, that's very, very serious. They might not be able to pay PAYE because they've used up that money. And even more seriously, they're not paying, they're not being able to pay corporate tax. Now they're in big trouble with the authorities. Right. Right. And typically the lack of skill in being able to claim the money is going to is going to reflect in the lack of skill of being able to negotiate good terms if they have to with those authorities. So I mean the stress on some of the leaders of these businesses, I wouldn't envy it at all. Gosh, yes. Yeah. I mean that's really putting you into a very destructive cycle. Absolutely. And why? What? Well, why are architects? Why are companies having unclaimed invoices? I mean, I know what it's like. I'm, personally, I've had it happen to me before. A client yes. hasn't paid, and you know there are all sorts of. I don't want to keep hassling them for it. They're going to pay me in a bit, or. Uh, but when it comes to sort of large, large sums of monies, that's uh, that's quite a chronic problem. Or chronic on on the verge of acute. I mean, chronic being it, it gradually gets worse. Acute, it could cause the business to collapse. Yeah, yeah. That's so that's a that's a bankruptcy. That's a bankruptcy situation right there. Yeah, and it happens. It's so, happening every so day. So what's missing? Yeah. What's what is what's the most common cause of unpaid invoices? Okay, of course people don't willingly set up a business to not get paid. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and typically architects set up a business because they want to create beautiful buildings, beautiful spaces. Uh, they want to put their passion and their expertise to work. Yes. So what's missing in one word is culture, a business culture, a, a, a solid business culture that has all the less savory, less pleasant parts of the business handled as powerfully as the fun, exciting, beautiful expertise parts of the business. Does that make sense, Ryan? What well, parts, what do you mean? What parts of the business would you say that are uns unsavory? Well, collecting debt. Who right. likes to call someone up and say, Oi, mate, you owe me money. When Pay up or else. Yeah. Who likes to do that? Typically, we do not want to upset client relationships. Yes. Right? So I hear this a lot from architects. So why is this still 90 days outstanding? Why, why have you guys done? Mm, well, we're hoping they haven't done anything. So I said, why not? They said, well, we don't want to upset the relationship with the client. Yes. Right? So my response to that, <laughs> and they don't always like it, right? But my response to that is, you can't upset it. They've already upset it. They're the ones who upset the relationship, right? Because you had an agreement. The agreement was, you'll provide all these wonderful services, this beautiful space, blah, 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 these drawings, et cetera, et cetera, on time to a spec, et cetera. They might have even pushed you to be on time, right? And, 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 and the, the exchange agreement there is that they do a whole bunch of other stuff. For instance, I would imagine you want them to participate mm. uh, to participate in the project. You want them to supply information when you need it on a timely basis. But above and beyond all that, you yeah, want them choose to choose fittings pay. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Choose the fittings, and then you, you need their time and energy for it to work properly. Yes, I know this myself, having had things built for me by architects. Um, but the um, the key is that you want to be paid the the agreed fees according to the agreed payment plan on time. That's their part of the deal. Yes. And if they don't keep that part of the deal up, then they're in breach. They're the one who's now upset the relationship. Now, typically, there's a, so I said culture, there's a very big culture problem because we have this belief, and, and let's, let's face it, it's been ingrained in our brains, in our non-conscious mind since childhood, right? That the customer is always right. You ever heard that? Yeah. Customer is king, okay? This is where the problems begin. So we position ourselves somewhat subservient to the customer. We don't want to upset them. 
but they've massively upset you. Not only that, they could cause your business to go bankrupt. Yes. If that's not an upset, what is an upset? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's criminal. As a matter of fact, it, I, I view it as criminal. They are borrowing money from you at zero interest without any terms and conditions and without your approval. Well, they do have your approval, actually, but without an official consent, without the proper agreement. So they're, they're building their business on your back, yours. You know, yeah, you're, give, you're giving out free loans. You're giving out free loans. Hey, could I please get an extension <laughs> on those terms? <laughs> Amazing. You're giving but, out, yeah. yeah. But try not to pay your mortgage on time and see what happens. They've got a system in place that holds you to account to pay the mortgage. They'll repossess your house. Right? So I was speaking to an architect a few weeks ago, and I was telling him, what did, what did you do? What have you done? You know, you're now 117 days, this invoice hasn't been paid. What's happened to the project? We've almost finished it. I said, so they haven't paid for phase one. They haven't paid for phase two. You're now at phase five. They haven't paid for the first two. And you carried on doing phase three, four, and five. And they haven't paid you with no intent, no proper communication, no nothing. But you've why did you carry on? Mm. Well, we were hoping we were, what well, the wishy-washy answers. Yes. So I was speaking to a firm of automotive parts a few weeks ago, and we were talking about this because I was checking their cash flow, and, uh, and it was, it, I was impressed. I mean, what they do is if a client, and their clients tend to be um, wholesale, uh, wholesale automotive uh, distributors, um, large garage franchises and things like this, and their policy is that if after four days the invoice isn't paid, they pull the service no more supply. Now that, of course, disrupts those people's businesses massively and they get their attention right away. And it's not the salespeople or the marketing people or even the operations people who decide this, it's credit control. Credit control frees the account and frees the supply. Mm. And so they have very, very little cash flow problem, very few cash flow problems. And uh, that's on the first offense. The second offense, I believe it's after one day. Right. Yeah. So it's as punctual as that. As punctual as that. And they've got a team of people. Certainly it's a big company. They've got a team of people who are paid to do nothing but that. Yeah. Gosh, it makes me really sort of think about how, how I could ever tolerate that. And it's it's really, you know, it's, it's yeah, it is. It's, unac it's unacceptable. It's, it's, very, it's absolutely it, it's, unacceptable. It, it's yeah. very dangerous. Yes. It's very, very dangerous. Yeah. So what, how can you cultivate a powerful relationship where you are able to not feel like you're subservient to your client yes not that they hold all the cards all the cards you know in the, in the hand Correct. as it were yeah how can you create this relationship where you can hold them accountable and what does that look like that's a very good question ryan the first thing you've got to do is a paradigm shift in your own mind so exactly what you've said you've got to start understanding that um, the, the customer is not king. Of course, we want to do a good job for the customer or the client. You know, yeah. We're committed to, to great service, etc. But you're both human beings. And you know, what, what, what astonishes me with um, especially experts, and not just architects, but all sorts of experts who are very good at what they do, and they start off probably very small, and they sell their, their wares, their services, and then they get bigger, and now they have staff, and they get bigger again, and they have more staff, and then they need to, they have more clients and they need to go now proactively seeking clients. So the human aspect gets bigger and bigger. Yet what they do not do is they don't learn more about human beings. And frankly, and sales, management, leadership, staff motivation, staff training, um, customer service, customer interaction, it's all human beings. It's psychology. 80% mm. of all of that is psychology. 20% is process. Right. We got it the wrong way around. We're just relying on process without understanding psychology, and often the processes are not in place as a result of that, or the wrong processes are in place, or insufficient processes in place. Right. So um, what to put in place, that has to happen right from the onset, is to understand that the customer is another fellow human being, they have a need, you have a potential service that you can supply. If there's a fit, then you can dance together. Yep. Right? You want to be creating parity. Right? Now, the culture that you that you bring to that conversation and the culture that you have in your company will have everything to do with the degree to which that parity is existent. Right. So it all starts with your own 
company culture and your own personal culture. And, uh, and the point there is right from the beginning, you want to um, be leading the conversation because they're the one with the problem or the need and you're the one with the answer. So technically, you're the one in control. You're the one with the goodies. You're the one with the solution. You're the one with the solution. So if, it, if there is going to be some in, imbalance, it should be the other way around because you've got the goodies and they haven't. Yeah. Right? So you should be the one in control with the power, but it's never that way. Mm. And uh, I mean, we can go into, we could talk all night long about the reasons why that is. That's, that's for a lot of psychological reasons, why not? But the bottom line is by creating parity right from the beginning, you set a tone, you set a professionalism, and it's all about having adult conversations, functional adult conversations. So you're being the leader, essentially. You're, you're being the leader. You're taking them through a process because they've come to you for help. Yeah. So you lead them through that process. If you don't lead them through the process, they'll lead you through the process, and it will be a default process, which is probably not a pretty picture. Yes, and it's not going to be helpful for either of you. It's not going to be helpful for either of you. No, they're going to treat you subservently, like a runaround boy, like a service provider. They're going to want to knock you down on price. So when they're going to want you to give them a whole bunch of free consulting. They want, they're going to want you to bend over backwards. But when it's their turn to do something, they'll delay. They'll find excuses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Payment is a classic there. Um, so you want to you want to uh, iron that out right from the beginning. So you know, late payment is the big elephant in the room. Let's yeah. face it. And I know every single time someone is acquiring a client, they're praying that that client will pay them on time. Yeah. Right. It's a big elephant in the room, but no one addresses it. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. Right. It's a huge elephant. I mean, if you went to a corner shop, right, <laughs> and and the cashier shortchanged you mistakenly or not by three pounds, you say, oi. My three pounds. Yeah. You hold them to account right away. Yeah. Right. But we're talking multi-million pound contracts here with maybe invoices of, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, 250,000 pounds unpaid. And we say nothing. That yeah. And, really, and, it's, and it's catastrophic for it's a company. It's catastrophic for, for a, company. a company. Yeah. And yeah. for all the people in the company and the families and you know, the whole society, the whole community around that company is affected. And we say we care about their people. If you really cared about your people, you'll collect the money so yeah. you can pay them and reward them and create beautiful spaces for them as well. Yeah. So, so when you yeah. first meet a client, they've yes. come to you with a problem, they've come to you where they want to do a project or it's a developer, they want to develop a site. Yeah. When do you bring this up? When do you say, I want to make sure you'll pay me on time? Well, if you, if you it, feel it and you have a sense that maybe they have a history of not paying on time, I will say before we go any further into all this, before you even tell me what your, the project is, we need to get clear on one thing, all right? Uh, you have a reputation for not paying your suppliers or not paying them on time. Mm. Did I get it wrong? And they'll say, well, yeah, we do delay our payments. I said, well, we might have a problem. I don't want to work with a client who delays payment. Shall we end it here? Now, I know that sounds really tough. And you know, the first few times I did this with people, I t my, my stomach was rumbling. <laughs> right? My guts were contracting. Yeah? It's, it's very counterintuitive. <laughs> but you've got to straighten their spines right, right up front. And if you can do that there, where there's no risk, there's no risk there because you both can walk away. Mm. Okay? And you can't lose what you never had anyway. Yeah. Right? So there's no risk. But if you enter into a contract with someone without having done all of that, then the risk is huge because now you've committed time, energy, people, resources, other companies, and so on and so forth, Gosh, and I'm, you can't service it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking from my own personal experiences, when I haven't done that kind of upfront, you know... Agreement. Here, yeah. Agreement, yes. and then it ultimately will default back to that kind of process of delayed payments. Yeah. I'm scrambling around trying to, you know, you know, borrow a bit of money from this bit to this bit to make sure that and that's paid. That's right. And they don't answer your calls and they don't reply to your emails and they don't reply to your texts. Or if they do, they say, speak to this other person. Oh, he's, he's, he's on uh, sick leave. Oh, we'll speak to the other one. They're not in today. And, it, you know, you run around. Yeah. Right. This is because no proper structure has been put in place up front. Yeah. So the structures, the tough structures need to be put in place up front. And, you know, you make no apology for it. This is this is adult business, mm. right? So, of course, when you're dealing with a client, if there is no uh, indication that perhaps 
they don't have a reputation for being bad or late payers, you might not bring it right away, but certainly before shaking hands, so after you've had all the nice conversation about all the beautiful things they want you to build, etc., 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 and you both feel there's a good fit, right, and they've agreed on the price, um, then uh, before shaking hands, you'll say, now there's a few things we must go over, the adult stuff, yeah, right. the housekeeping stuff, and that's where you dress the, all the details of that agreement. So what is expected from the architect and his firm in no uncertain terms, so, and I would write that down. So actually in verbal conversation. Verbal conversation, then recorded on paper, yep. right? Either as a contract or, I mean, in my business, I usually have that as a, an email, uh, a record of the conversation we had. So it's a little less formal. Right. But nevertheless, it's there. So if we need to bring it up later, what exactly did we agree on again? Yeah. Just refer to the email, okay? Or to a contract, but you want it down in writing at some point. Um, and uh, you will put everything that the architect firm promises to deliver, yeah, and everything that the client promises to deliver, right? including the payment of the fees in full according to the payment plan on time. Right. right. And I would read that out and have them read it out before shaking hands so that we are both absolutely clear on what we're. On, on what on what game we're playing here? So it's, it's not enough to just send that as an email, or they won't or, read. Or, no, you you certainly not. I mean, everyone sends it as an email, and guess what happens? <laughs> yeah, you want to look at them in the eyes before you shake hands and said, "So what you're agreeing on is you're agreeing to spend X amount of time a week with my team, so that we can communicate, right? Provide all the information we need for the planning, et cetera, et cetera, and pay these fees according to this payment plan on time." Now, let's not step over the elephant in the room. I will say this. Architects, the large majority of architecture firms have stacks of unpaid invoices. We're not one of them, and we never want to become one of them. It cripples architecture businesses. So we only work with clients who pay on time. Is there any reason why you might not pay us on time? I want to hear it now before we all commit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very direct. It's very. very it's straight. an adult conversation. It's money. Yeah. It's huge amounts of money, huge amounts of time, other people's livelihoods, other companies involved, subcontractors, and so on and so forth. This is serious business. You've got to have the serious conversation. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't have it because you're not wired that way or you feel uncomfortable, hire someone into your company who is that way inclined, maybe more extrovert than you, who can sit down and have those proper conversations over a cup of coffee or whatever in a civil manner but it's got to be covered and then before we shake hands i always tell them you know this is tough you know you're probably not used to paying on time we expect you to pay on time you can back out now if you don't think you'll be able to pay on time because we only work with people who pay on time yeah yeah god i can i can see how powerful actually having it as a like a, a proper conversation up front yes it's a different emotional experience for both yes. of you Yes. And it's setting a very, very different tone. Yes, it, it's, it's creating a culture for your business. Now, how many architects have I worked with who tell me the firm I have right now is not the firm I wanted to have? Mm. We're not working with the clients we wanted to work on. We're not working on the beautiful projects we were hoping we have to take lesser projects. All right? Well, one of the reasons why they have to take lesser projects is their cash flow is so up the spout. They need cash in. They'll take anything mm. to get cash in. Yeah, and then and this downward spiral begins. Yeah, yeah. and and I imagine it's the, it's the same kind of uh, causes that would cause you to undercharge as well. Absolutely. Well, well, yeah, discounting. That's a whole. We can have a whole other conversation about discounting and the reasons people discount. Yeah. And okay, discounting. I used to work for a fast food chain, and we used to discount as a very aggressive, well thought out campaign to steal some customers from the competition for a limited amount of time and show them that we were better. Yeah. So by giving them a very strong incentive to come to us, we'd hope to hook them. Yeah. Onto having at least maybe 60 or 70% of their fast food lunches with us rather than with the competition. All right. And, uh, and, and that was very carefully planned and we knew ex the exact impact on cash flow, on bottom line profits, on sales growth and so on and so forth. It was well calculated and when the campaigns went very well, they were massively in our favor. When they didn't, we cut them right away. Yeah, so it was, it was a clear strategized A plan. clear strategized. And you can do that with commodities in a price war. You know, stuff off the shelf, it's price sensitive. Go down Oxford Street 
or to one, a shopping mall, and you can see all the shops, all the clothes shops, are, they're fighting each other on price. Yeah. For like for like items, but with high end services, like architecture, or the work I do, consultants, you don't want to be fighting the competition on price. You want to be well rewarded in a in a fair, just, and prompt manner. Yeah. For the great energy and service and products that you provided to your select customers. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine I'm an architect yeah. and I'm listening to this conversation and I'm thinking, all right, I've got a number of clients who are 30 days behind, yeah. maybe even a week behind. Yeah. And I know that I've got my salaries to pay. I've got my rent to pay. And I've been justifying, you know, been been concerned, worried about upsetting the relationship. Yeah. I want them to give me more work. And I haven't done anything about it. And I know I've got these invoices which are unpaid. What do I do? What's the one thing that I could do immediately upon listening to this? Yes. What's the one action that I would could take? Okay. Communication is the WD-40 of human relationships. You've got to get into communication with the decision makers you initially did the deal with. Yeah. Okay, not the junior people, the top people. We tend to, we tend to want to go to the junior people first because it's going to be an easier conversation. Yeah, or like right. a, a light email somewhere. A light email, no. You want to get on the phone and speak to the top person. Even better, ask them for a meeting. So don't deal with it on the phone. Ask them, can we meet for lunch and get a lunch meeting? Do it over lunch. People like to have lunch. Then they'll come and they'll come for a free lunch, right? And then you deal with it over lunch and you get their commitment over lunch to either pay in full or if they are generally having problems and you're convinced that they're being authentic about it, then you can um, help them put the payment plan in place. That works for you and works for them. But then you've got to hold them to account ruthlessly. So you've got to say, if you are putting a payment plan in place, it says, we've put the payment plan here, you've agreed to it, but is it... Is it going to end up just like the, the, the initial invoice? Your payment plan is going to be now 90 days out. And they said, no, we promise we'll pay out. Time. So then you've got to have a follow-up system. So either you or a senior person in accounts needs to then write down on a diary, shared between you with a big red flag on it. The client is expected to pay today. You put the date. Yeah. Right. And if they don't, someone must check. And if they don't, you're straight on the case with them. I would even send them rem reminders beforehand because it's in your interest to get them to start collaborating. Because if they're doing it to you, they're probably doing it to others. Yeah. Right? So you're not going to change their integrity overnight or their behavior overnight, but what you might manage to do is get your invoice to the top of the pile. And that's a big step right there already. That's probably 50%. The other 50%, history tells me, is they're going to play around with you. All right? They're going to say, yeah, yeah, we'll pay, and they don't pay. Yeah. Now you're getting into the chasing game. That's very frustrating. Yeah, well, time just a total radio silence. Radio silence, very, very common. Or they send you around the houses. Yeah, speak to this one, speak to this one, speak to this one. Right. In that case, I go straight for the juggler. I call, I, I, I and I have on, on my roller decks in my in my uh, database. I have a list of cutthroat debt collectors, <laughs> and I send them off. I send send the Dobermans. Yeah. Yeah. They're in breach. They're in breach and they don't even have the decency to be in communication with you and to honor gentlemen's agreements yeah, or, or written contracts, even worse, send the Dobermans. And there's a lot of very, very good companies that, that will charge you in all different ways. Um, in my contracts with my clients, is there's a clause that they sign and it says that if at any point I have to collect debt from them and employ people, I shall charge it back to them. And any un unpaid money will be charged that Bank of England um, interest debt, rates yeah but yeah. Bank of England debt collection rates which right. I think is about 11% now right it's okay. an either 9 or 11% I can't remember it's, it's high and people say that's very high so that's, that's look yeah. at, if you look at the Department of Trade and Industry they have a whole website basically dedicated to debt collection and giving you advice on how, how to go about it but the one thing you must not do is ignore it you've got to be on the case in a very timely manner and they've got to know that you are someone not to mess with yeah so if you have those conversations right up front and said, this is what we expect, can you deliver? If not, tell me now, and we'll end it right now. They say, no, we will pay on time. Okay, great, I've had it from you. Then you put the structures in place to follow up on that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And it's, it's interesting because in our sort of standard forms of agreements that you yes. might get from Reba, 
um, there will be, you know, those kinds of clauses yes. in there, but to actually bring them to the forefront and actually verbally communicate them with a potential client and have them agree yeah. is a very different uh, scenario than just emailing a, a contract. Yes. And because a lot of architects will even um, not even send out the standard forms of appointment to contracts because they look too formal in themselves. Yes. It scares them. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we're like, well, it's yeah. residential clients. I don't want to. That's yeah. a bit heavy for them. Yeah. I want to keep it a little bit. Yeah. Warn them. Warn them up front. Listen, I'm about to send you the small print. Yeah. The housekeeping stuff. It's heavy, but that's how it is. Yeah. yeah? Warn them in advance. Yeah. yeah. It's not me. It's my credit controllers. Yeah. So play good do- good guy, bad guy. You know, it's a credit controllers, and they insist that we have to do it this way. And so, please, you know, any questions, any queries, let me know. But they'll accept it. They accept it from the mortgage company. Yeah. Without question. <laughs> they don't want their house to be repossessed. <laughs> right. So yes. they pay on time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, people people always operate generally in their self interest, and people always reveal themselves. So you got to listen. So this is why, eighty percent of sales, marketing. Any form of human interaction, be it um, training, motivating, hiring, firing people, um, client interaction, customer service, it's all psychology. 80% of it's psychology. 20% of it is process. 80% psychology. Most architects have a very high, um, what I would call, uh, detail or process or engineer, their engineer analytical, lines. analytical, very analytical. So their analytical intelligence is very high. Their emotional intelligence or their psychological intelligence dealing with all the stuff is typically low. So they avoid that side of the business. Mm. So any uncomfortable calls. So every architecture company should have someone in their team at the junior or the senior that they train up to do the uncomfortable stuff. In other words, follow up on the, be, be the, the Marines, if you like, use that word later on, yeah. be the commandos of the Marines to support the credit controller. Typically, the credit controller or the accounts team will be what I call... Um, sort of uh, cash flow guardians. The cash flow guardians. Yeah, you want cash flow guardians uh, who are parachuted out, if you like, to, to bring the money in. But your regular, ca- your regular um, uh, accounting clerks or whatever, they are typically slow-paced, introverts, very detail orientated. Oh. They don't like change. They don't like conflict. And they work hard, and, and they're very good at what they do. But they don't like conflict. So don't put them in conflict situations. You need someone who's much more extrovert, a bit like more like the salesman's profile or negotiator profile. They're extrovert, and it's, it's water off the duck's back to have a fight or, or a conflict for them. Now, I'm not saying we should have conflicts, but tough conversations. Yeah. yeah? They don't take it personally, whereas more the sensitive people um, in, in, in the back offices, they, they don't like these conversations. So yeah. forcing them to have it is not going to be a good, they'll leave. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to bring in, you know, they're what I call the Labradors. You need some Dobermans in your team. Yeah. And very few architectural practices I've worked with have Dobermans in their team. Yeah. They're all engineer minds, analytical minds, of course, because that's architecture. A few of them are inspirational, but they don't, they're not Dobermans either. They're Panda bears. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, if, and if you're like a one-man practice and you haven't got the Dobermans in your business, what could you do to kind of get your inner Doberman out? You, you, need, to learn how, you need to learn that. You need, you need to learn it. You need to, first of all, make it a priority and to learn the skills. Yeah. And so I, te- I teach all leaders, whether they have the Dobermans in their team or not, to do that because they need to be able to recognize Dobermans and they need to be able to guide the Dobermans in their organization. So every leader I work with becomes a good debt collector. Brilliant. Yeah. Johan, thank you very much. I think we've pretty much run out of time here. We could go on for, um, for, for a little while, I, f- I feel, on this topic. Yes. Um, you said that was the one, the first problem. What, was, what did you say the second one was? The second problem is very much time management and prioritization. So uh, leaders are often doing... Leaders are not doing leaders' jobs. They're not following a leader role. They're still caught up in the technicality of architecture. And as a result of that, if they've got a team of people, they become a bottleneck in the organization. Got it. And And would you be happy to come and discuss that at a later date on another podcast? Invite me and I'll be happy to come, Ryan. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And if somebody wants to get in contact with you and learn more about your services or they've 
they've got maybe £150,000 worth of uh, unpaid invoices. What's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Uh, they can uh, contact me through you if they wish, or okay. they can contact me direct on my uh, my email is johan, J-O-H-A-N, at magnifyyourgreatness.com, all in one word. And my website is www.magnifyyourgreatness.com. Brilliant. I should put that in our resources. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you again for listening. And don't forget that those early bird tickets for the next Business and Architecture UK live event are now on sale. And you can get those by booking online in the link that's in the information of this podcast. Look forward to seeing you there.